So this is your sole income. Yeah. Now. Yes. It is. That's amazing. COVID hit in 2020. It was absolute mayhem. I went from selling maybe 20 birds a week to 175 in two hours. So I was up at four that morning, went to bed at two, woke up at four. It's just, they're bigger, they're dopic, they're, they're just not pleasant to work with. Dopic, for those of you not in the know, is a <laughs> Pennsylvania Dutch term. Filet is always sold a month before the animal's even processed. And what's your price per pound on that? On filet? Yeah. $38. October of 23, I chose all my processing dates for the year of 24. Hi folks, my name is Derek Everly. I'm a young entrepreneur in Southeastern Pennsylvania. I co-own a small butcher shop and a cattle company that specializes in pork and beef, especially shares and bundles. I've had so many amazing conversations with our customer base over the last four years. And I wanna share with you what's going on in the post COVID world, people who actually have hope and are excited about the future. That's the theme behind Prepared and Peaceful. So I hope you'll stick around for today's episode. Blake Miller and his wife and family run Wing Swept Acres in Sinking Spring, Pennsylvania, very close to my shops. And if you stick around, you'll see if you have what it takes to be a farmer. Thanks for watching. All right, so we have, right now we're down to six steers, nine hogs right now. We have approximately 400-ish layers, about 1,200 broilers. And do your layers go year-round? Like you have them on pasture? Yes. All of the time? The whole year. Winter and everything. Winter How do you winter. handle water in the winter? How do you water? A tank that I bring out and just dump it into their, their bowls almost every day. I have two 15-gallon tubs that I use. Mm -hmm. Every morning you chip the ice, bring more water out with you and fill it yeah. up. So it's just a daily refresh. You're gonna, you have yes. piles of ice there that kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go Coming through the meadow. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. I know that's always a challenge and that's why we don't do woods raised hogs in the winter time. Yes. Um, but you have that. Ours are so outside. you've chosen the hard way to do this stuff. The most impossible <laughs> way to do it. <laughs> Especially after the rain that we've been getting, I yeah. mean, it is just an absolute nightmare. So for folks, this is spring of 2024. We have probably received eight inches of rain in the last two weeks. Something ridiculous. Something very to close to that. Uh, it has been a really, really wet spring for us. And there are issues that come along, big Absolutely. issues that come along with that. Absolutely. But yeah, so hogs outside year round. Yes. That's what people want. Like, that's what people are looking for, in right. my opinion. Yeah, I mean, they are, but it's, I think it's honestly better than raising them inside a barn anyway, because they're, oh, yeah. they're out in the elements, they know where to go when it's raining, they know where to hide when they need to. They you have need, shelter for them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think the challenge is you know, providing a place where they can get out of the wind, right. and, and really making sure that that is dry and windproof is the biggest thing. Yeah, their favorite day of the week is the day I go out with a bale of straw. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then they just kind of tear everything. They, I don't have to spread it. They just tear yep. into it and put it where they want it. Set, it. set it there. And then, of course, cattle most commonly are put out year-round. There's very few uh, places. I did see, when I was over there a couple of weeks ago, a run-in shed yes. for them and yeah. then a hay, a hay bale feeder yes. to supplement over winter. Correct. Because you're doing grass-fed and finished. Yes, 100% grass-fed and finished. Yeah, No grain ever, and you're even uh, doing... Vaccine free, which is like right. the new. So a lot of people do antibiotic and hormone free, but the very best are also doing vaccine free. It's a little bit more difficult, I think. You have to make sure that your cattle selection, your genetic selection, yes, is correct. 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 You can't just put uh, any animal. There are some breeds that struggle. I know uh, Red Devon struggle with pink eye, mm -hmm. and so there are ways that you can address that without vaccines. But I think that was the traditional way. Yeah, that, that was taken care of. Yeah, everything that we do is all hormone free, antibiotic free, no injections of any kind in anything. Yeah, I own a butcher shop and a small cattle company, or I should say, co-own a butcher shop and cattle company. You are a small. Would you say small? Yeah. Farm, pretty close to us, about fifteen minutes away. Yeah. Same customer base. Uh, so my question is, I know why I started doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it came around the time that we had our first child. I always knew that pastured meats were important and that eating clean and, and healthy and then really looking at how we can do better than the current system. 
Yeah. I should say the commodity system. My mom was, I was homeschooled for 12 grades. My mother was a huge influence on me in that way, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, problems that come along with being homeschooled for 12 years. (laughs) Um, She was a huge influence on me. And so what was your influence? What made you want to jump into this world? Kids. Same exact reason. I started to see a shift. My grandfather always said, you know, our food is garbage. He passed away, and I was like, come on, what you, there's, there's no way. So he knew something already. He knew already. something way, way ahead of time. He grew up in the grand era of American propaganda. Yes. Like, he was probably born, what year, roughly? 40s. So the supermarkets really only came yeah. along in the 50s. He would have been exposed to the, the really the grand yeah. era of commodity system food. Right. And he, he always used to say, ah, oh, that's poison. That's poison. I'm like, come on, Pops. No, it's not. It's, it's yeah. fine. Like, everybody else is eating it. And then... I started doing a little bit of research and found out a couple of things. And I said, hey, I'm going to start growing some food for our family and friends. And I started with chickens. The, the gateway backyard. drug. I think yes. I say that on every <laughs> single episode when people say chickens. Yes, we had a couple layers. I had a couple layers as a kid. Um, never grew my own broilers or anything. And I said, you know, I want to know where my kids' food's coming from. So I'm going to throw in 50 birds. I think 25 made it or so. First time, you know, had no idea. I was like, ah, egg layers, broilers, same difference. Yeah, it's a chicken. Yeah, and it's not similar, (laughs) but different. And then the following year, I did another batch, twice as big. And that following February, I said, see you, bye. I'm quitting my job and becoming a farmer. What were you doing previous? Construction. I saw on your website it said 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. Yes. So you were driving. That's Yeah, it was Philly. One day, Reading the next day, Boyertown another day, New uh, Norristown another day. Like, it was just all over. Yeah. So, for those listening, again, we're in southeastern Pennsylvania, Berks, Lebanon, Lancaster County mm-hmm. area. You're in Berks, I yes. believe. And there's a million people in those three counties. So, fairly populated. Yes. But there's still, there's so much agriculture here. And what was the first product you produced? You said eggs. I guess, yes. We had our, well, we just had three or four hens in the backyard just for the family, mm-hmm. go out, collect the eggs, cook them. And then we started with the broilers. Okay. On pasture, of course. I guess. By the time they were done, it was a dirt patch in my backyard, but <laughs> I live and it learn. wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now when I drive by your farm, and it is, you can see it from the road Yeah, very nicely. You see beautiful pasture, tall grass. Yes. And you also have goats that you rotate around that helps to, we do. you know, break up the animals that are on pasture yes. as well. So- you're bringing in sheep yes, as well. Uh, what is the push behind that? Uh, the market. Everybody asks, do you have lamb? Do you have lamb? And they walk around. Does anybody else here have lamb? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I mean, there are options there, but people that want something that's a little cleaner, local, mm-hmm. and I've seen a huge shift for that all around. Yeah. They, they the push for local. Yes. Yeah. So what kind of people are asking for this? What, what's the demographic? Does it have an ethnic everybody. basis? Everyone, Everyone wants yes. Anybody lamb. and everybody that is looking for lamb, they mm. they want to. So I think it be, local. because it is a grass fed product, as beef gains in popularity as a grass fed yeah. product, lamb goes very nicely along with that, and it kind of helps break up your eating. Yeah, <laughs> kind of helps uh, your not just eating <laughs> ground beef for for months and months on end. Right. And I do know that they complement the beef really well. Are you going to be running them together? What's the plan? That I don't know yet. Um, kind of see how it works out. It's some of that's yeah. based on infrastructure. What fences? Well, everything that we have is a high tensile. Uh, the perimeter is a six strand high tensile electric. Mm-hmm. So I can break it up with single strand, four strand, you know, just run from post to post or whatever. Um, yeah. But as of now, I would probably run them separately. We just had our first two lambs born at the farm. Mm-hmm. And right now, they're doing good, but I wouldn't want to put a little six, seven pound lamb up against a thousand pound steer. Yeah, they can be a little <laughs> bit. Um, I don't think they do it intentionally, but they're just right. so large. You're running Black Angus Simmental, correct? Crosses, and they're doing nicely. Yeah. They're growing. Yeah, even through the winter, uh, that's I think the struggle that a lot of producers have is how do you keep them moving during the winter? Yeah, that is the biggest struggle because we have a five acre hay field right at the edge of the property that we use. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to really use that yet 
some of it I have, mm-hmm. um, but we don't have the hay storage. So now we just put up a hay barn and yep. we'll be able to grow, hopefully, enough hay to make it last through the winter for everything. Yeah. So this is working. You're able to expand your infrastructure a little bit. Yeah. Um, so financially, things are are moving in the right direction, at yes. least. I don't think there's any farmer that would say that they're swimming in it. Oh, no. Uh, absolutely not. For every dollar you make, 90 cents goes back into the farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do they say? A farmer is the only one that buys at retail and sells at wholesale? Yes. that's And pays about, the freight both ways. Yes, that's about correct. Feels like that. So you mentioned that the kids were the catalyst. How old are your children? They are eight and all but ten. Okay. Is your wife involved in the yes. day-to-day? Yes, she is. So let's just uh, set the stage a little bit here. Your primary sales are through your market stands. Correct. So you've chosen to do farmer's markets. Keystone Cattle Company has chosen, so we have a physical location mm-hmm. at our butcher shop, but then we also do a lot of online advertising um, and kind of rely on that. What would you say are the benefits of having a market stand? Would you recommend it to someone <laughs> <laughs> to someone who's thinking about as as a person this. who decided to quit their job to become a farmer, no, don't go the market route. That market will suck up all of your time. So yeah, that's become kind of an issue for us because I am there half a day Tuesday, half a day Wednesday, Thursday all day, Friday all day, Saturday all day, and then we also have another market on Saturday. So we're, we're both my wife and I are each at a market on a Saturday. So you're at separate. Yes. Markets the same, Two different locations, same day. Same what do the kids do on a Saturday? Do they help out? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, still they're, just. They're still, they go with my parents or my in-laws for the night. Yeah. And yeah. So this is really like, this is still kind of make it or break it time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's always make it or break it yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> so how many years are you in it now? Uh, we just passed six years. Okay. So this, so we started just after you guys. So 2018, you would mm-hmm. have started. February of 2018. Yeah. We started January of 19. Okay. Back when the world was still normal, normal, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, yeah, that's and actually what kind of pushed us in the direction that we went. Because by that point, we were just selling uh, chicken and eggs out of a farm stand alongside the road, and yeah, it was very, very difficult. So that was actually the start. Was the it's like a self serve, mm-hmm. like a, a Cash shed? Only, drop yeah, mo- mm-hmm. dropping in the mailbox. Boom. Yeah, the neighbors that are driving by, they get to you know see right. So now you have a lot more reach with your market stands. Yeah, I mean, the when COVID hit in 2020, it was absolute mayhem. I went from selling maybe 20 birds a week to 175 in two hours. We had a drive through system set up at the farm. People came. I limited the packages to two per car. People were coming to the farm. People were coming to the farm. We were posting on Facebook, you know, and whatever, yep. and coming to the farm between 5 and 7 on a Thursday, and it was... And just, like, clean out your entire... Oh, there was nothing left. Your... Nothing left. And that's actually what gave us the jump and the push that we needed to get to where we are. It gave you the attention you needed. Correct. It, it sort of rerouted people's brains. Mm-hmm. Not sort of. It massively rerouted Absolutely. people's brains as, in the way they thought about food. And we're seeing the... I have been seeing the effects of that ever since. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I think a lot of small farmers, if they're able to you know, actually produce the product Mm -hmm. and get it to market and utilize social media. You mentioned Facebook was the way you're communicating with people. Is that Mm -hmm. still a big part of what you do? Facebook, Instagram. Yep. I know that has worked out well for us. I think it, and that's why I wanted to begin to podcast a little bit Mm -hmm. because I want to get people that behind the scenes. One of the things you mentioned is difficulty of like having to actually staff the stand yourself. Oh yeah. Because like I still work every other Saturday Mm -hmm. and The other owner, uh, Eric, he works the other Saturday. So we really appreciate the ability to have that interaction, that direct contact with our people. And Um, that's what they want. They want to see the owner there, the farmer there. If they have a question, nobody's going to answer it the way I would. I mean, I could could have a whole list of questions that people always ask. And, hey, if they say this, say this. Mm -hmm. But they're going to say, hang on one second, let me check the, the book here. No, yeah. if you hear it straight from that person's mouth, room, but, yeah. oh, okay. There are a lot of places that ship yeah. meat. We do ship pork and beef, but a l- bulk of our sales, people want to come in. They want to f- sense your honesty, mm-hmm. your genuineness. Right. Because it's not just anyone that goes and starts, and I'm not putting myself at the same level uh, by any means. Keystone does raise a bulk of 
the animals that we sell, but we also are an aggregate. We, we have uh, producers right. as well. We partner with other, actually a lot of them are young guys <laughs> looking to make it in whatever their specific field of passion is. As many new consumers has come on the market, so have there been more producers? Oh, well, yeah, I and think. it's not like there's there's not a, a, too many producers. No, it's not market. polluted yet. It's No, not even close. I mean, there's still plenty of things that are, are – there's holes that need to be filled everywhere. Yeah. I mean, we've run into the issue here lately where I can't have enough chicken, can't have enough beef. And, well, when are you going to have it? Well, two more weeks. What? You don't have anything? I said, no. This, this time last year, I had sales on beef to get rid of it. Yeah. Just because I was getting backed up with inventory, and now it's like, mm-hmm. what's a sale? There is no yeah. inventory. I mean, it's it's absolutely insane. And we're doing the exact same amount of beef that we were doing last year at this time. I see. It, that you've grown that much. Yeah. I noticed a real big uptick last fall. Okay. For whatever reason. Yeah. I don't know. Just Because general. it was sagging a little bit before that. Mm-hmm. I noticed that there were... Different hit a slump. Yeah, there COVID were, hit, went up, and then you kind of slowly trickled down, and it's like, yeah. well, what's going to happen here? But something happened in fall of twenty three, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it relates to an election year. Like, I hate to think that people are buying this stuff out of fear, but again, we said it reroutes your brain, and right, people want to feel good. And when you eat grass fed beef, you feel good. Yeah. When you eat pastured pork, you feel good. Yeah. Because it's not loaded with, and, and it tastes better. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it honestly <laughs> tastes a whole lot better. Absolutely. So one question that was on my mind, do you farm with money or for money? Hmm. Uh, that's a good one. It's a little bit of both. Okay. But it's definitely for money because there is not much to start with. <laughs> yeah. So did you have someone who, you mentioned your grandfather, were there influence that came, because I had people in my life that came in and they, especially older people that had a little bit of cash stored up already, mm-hmm. were there people that came in and both were encouraging, you know, emotionally, but also financially? Yes. We had some financial help from our parents to get started. I mean, that was so grateful that, I mean, without it, without that and cashing in on my 401k, I never would have, yeah. never would have even started it. I so mean, your four hundred one k now has four legs and hair, yeah. <laughs> and or, or lays two eggs. Legs and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I mean, everybody said you're absolutely nuts. You have this great job doing construction. You know, everybody in your family did construction. Oh, well, that's the path that I was yeah. taking. But I said, yeah, but it's not fun. I wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I drive to Philly. I don't get back till five. Kids are in bed by 6.30, 7 o'clock at that age. Like, it was no time with the family. And I said, yeah. oh, I'll be a farmer. I'll have plenty of time with the family. Is that how that works? In the beginning. <laughs> now, <laughs> no. <laughs> now the family comes to the farm f- with me. <laughs> yeah. And I think that is a huge part of the value that being in agriculture brings is that your family can be around. Right. And you can teach them meaningful real-world skills. anybody yeah. from mm-hmm. 3 to 100. I yeah. mean, yeah. He, you can do something. If you can pick up an egg, exactly. you can be helpful. Exactly. We talked a little bit about the difficulties of COVID. Uh, we were still in our infancy then. We didn't have Keystone. We did have the butcher shop, and I know we just worked and worked and worked. Mm-hmm. There was, if we went from nobody cared at all about a startup butcher shop, and then <laughs> midway through the spring of 2020, we just, we haven't stopped since. Oh, yeah. this, this is the first year that I've been able to relax a little bit and not work all those long days. And butchering's very hard. Really? Farming's very hard. This is the first winter where I didn't get my normal downtime. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been go, go, go. Well, I appreciate you making the time uh, <laughs> to be here. But this is important. I, I want to tell people stories because so many times you get in front of a customer and they just don't understand the full picture. Right. And I want to inform people at scale to just talk to one person it, at a farm stand. It would just be nicer to be to scale more right. with the information. And I think that social media is the farmer's privilege mm-hmm. now to combine those two because you get to show people what you're made of. You get to show people what you're doing and your character, but you can do it at a scale that makes a little bit more sense. It's a little bit more efficient. Right. So I appreciate people that, and not that you have to do it, but I appreciate people that that make that effort. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we appreciate every single customer, no matter how big or small. I mean, we have some people that come and 
buy once every other week, once a month. And we have other ones that buy every meal that week because they do meal prep. And they just come and just, I'll take six of these, four of those, two of those, boom. And they all, I mean, it's the biggest help no matter how. And that's probably the most flattering thing, I think, as a food producer, when someone is looking at, like, utilizing, especially a protein producer, Mm Mm-hmm. What you're, what you're growing and making that a huge, that becomes a huge part of their life. Oh yeah. And we understand the impact and, of that. And they are very upset when you're not there for the week. If you take off for a week or whatever, right. like going on a family vacation. I do warn, I'd say 90% of our customers, especially the ones that I know come every single week. I'm saying, Hey, you know, next week we won't be here. Is this going to be enough to get you through? Yeah. I still have some in the freezer or no, thank you for reminding me. You know, now I'll, They'll and stock I don't want to sound like a jerk and say, Hey, I'm trying to sell you more, but no, I'm just trying to make sure right. certain people that I know that it's like, they can't go without it anymore. You're the do everything guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you, you're doing everything. <laughs> yeah. And what are your hopes for scale? Are you at the place where you want to be? What does it look like in 10 years to be a farmer? All right. So you, 10 years. 10 years is pretty far. Yeah, it is. But I'd really like to see a lot of expansion because I'm hoping by that point my son will be 18. Okay. I'm hoping that he'll have some interest in the farm industry and want to take over at some point. A a portion of it, at least. At least a portion of it or uh, just jump in and work side by side and then kind of go from there and say, hey, all right, you're doing great. How about you do this by yourself? I can focus more on this and, or just do more scale just to help both of us out. Right. And give us both something to do because we don't have enough already. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. But make sure that the income is there so that it can can support both of our families. You can actually designate the time because that's, that's the big thing. And that's why I want to take to social is because like we literally don't have the time. Right. As you said, it's a huge pleasure to be able to talk to someone face-to-face, and you value each individual. What is the most difficult day you have had as a farmer? Is that limited to the farm or farm slash market? Yes, the whole whole thing, because it's all tied together. You couldn't have the farm if you didn't have the outlet. Right, and because I I have to tell people that all the time. They're like, well, you get to go home after this. What do you do the other three days of the week? I said, well, I'm a farmer. I farm seven days a week. Produce the stuff I'm selling? Yeah. Um... (laughs) So probably the worst day ever was not this past year for Thanksgiving, but the year before. 22. 22. We had just purchased Fairgrounds Market Stand. Yeah, it was new for you at the time. Yeah, that was our first Thanksgiving there. I had no idea what to expect. So I actually ordered 300 turkeys. Okay. In July. You're swinging for the fence. Yes. Well, That sounds I, like a I, lot of birds. I, mean, I, I know you move volume there, but... It was that... a lot. And I thankfully, I mean, unthankfully, but thankfully lost the most ever that year. Like it was, we had a flood, with the one water line right where the poults were burst one night right over their pen, and I lost 75% of that batch. And they're not cheap, by the no, way. Like a turkey no. poult, a baby, yeah. is... What by now? Seven or eight dollars? Uh, yeah, now it is, yeah. Yeah, and they are not the toughest creatures. No, if you can Lord get them made. past two <laughs> weeks, you're doing great. If you can get them to six weeks, you're golden. But yeah, it was, finally came time to process the birds. I was down to 188. Yes. That, that is was, not a lot. No, no, it was, that was a rough year. Yeah. Friday, we get them processed before Thanksgiving because we have our other market in Malvern on Saturdays, and that's our turkey delivery day. Okay. So my wife helped me as long as she could. She had to have the kids overnight at our house because we didn't have any help from any family members. They were all busy that night. I said, not a problem. I'll be able to sort through them all by myself. It shouldn't take me too long. Getting orders ready. Right. Yeah. Now this... For people who had pre-ordered them. Correct. Every every turkey is pre-ordered. We very rarely have anything left. I always set a couple aside just in case something happens. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's all pre-order. Yeah. So you're, I'm already sweating bullets from July through November as I'm writing down orders on a piece of paper saying, I hope I hope that they make it. But yeah, so that morning, woke up early, got to the market, left the market, picked up the birds, came back, and I had to sort through them, weigh them, and assign them to each customer. So you know what, how to correctly charge exactly. them. Exactly. Well, 
and everybody asks for a certain weight. Oh, right. We get within, I'd shoot for two pounds, but. Of the requested weight. The requested because weight. you kind of give them a parameter. They're right. going to be. I say, you know, give me, give me five pounds. pounds. Two yep. and a half up, two and a half yep. down. Either way. I was there until one o'clock in the morning <laughs> going through weighing. Thankfully, it was freezing cold. Didn't need to worry about refrigeration. They were yeah. in tubs in a trailer, an enclosed trailer. But yeah, it was miserable. So I was up at four that morning, went to bed at two, woke up at four to load everything back onto the trailer out of the walk-in cooler for those orders and then go down to the market and do it. It was like to, never to be there in time bed. for open. Yes. Because it opens at what, 7 a.m.? No, that one opens up at, at that point, it is nine. Okay, so, so I drive down to Malvern, yep. and I had to prep everything, get it ready for the Saturday market at Reading. Because when at nine o'clock people are walking in, oh, and no, they there's want a line at eight. Yeah, they get there real early, <laughs> thinking that they're going to get it, thinking that they're going to get it sooner. And yeah. no, it's not happening. Just give me a moment. That turkey season is the most brutal time yeah. in general. I've heard a lot of guys say that. A lot of uh, farmers. Yeah. Oh, if yeah. I didn't have to raise them, I wouldn't. They destroy the pasture. Is they're heavier than they, a chicken. Oh yeah, and when they scratch, they, they the love whole to root scratch. Comes out. Yep. I mean, they, they fight all the time. Like it, mm-hmm. it's just they're bigger. They're dopic. They're they're just not pleasant mm-hmm. to work with. Dopic, for those of you not in the know, is a <laughs> Pennsylvania Dutch term that certainly your mother taught you, or, or your grandfather. Yeah. Uh, it just means not full of good sense. Correct. And maybe a little bit clumsy. Yes. <laughs> yes. At the same absolutely. time. Absolutely. But they they also know how to throw their weight around when needed. Yeah. Yeah, they'll beat you up. So you said those 180 turkeys. Yeah. Or how many did you do for this Thanksgiving? Uh, this past year, 165. Okay, so similar Yeah. Similar, similar numbers. Similar numbers, yeah. Mm-hmm. I kind of find the sweet spot, and I kind of gauge now which market is going to take how many birds. and right. It's a little bit there. more settled. But it's a tremendous amount of work to convert them from a live animal that's right. on pasture into a frozen turkey or do you do fresh, fresh. Do you do fresh turkeys do now fresh you... turkeys yes <laughs> everybody buy from fresh, this guy so, people so yeah it's it's uh it's it's a struggle but um you have some people that will come and will give a range of most years it's 12 to 22 pounds because i get them two weeks apart and you have your your bell curve for each flock so i kind of can guesstimate how many 15 pound how many 20 pound how many jumbos that i'm gonna have yeah. but it's never, never right. Before COVID, if it wasn't 20 pounds, people didn't want it. They didn't want it, nothing less than 20. Mm-hmm. Now, sweet spot's 15, 16, right around there. Yeah. I think figuring out for the sake of your customers, there's like an initial time where you're kind of feeling each other out. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. kind of getting to know what the preferences are. And that can be difficult Yeah. Uh, initially. But then once you kind of get into that groove, it's really nice. But then every year, there's always a, a change. I, I know like... A different theme for each year or a well, different just, trend. Just like, yeah, different trends. Like, uh, of course, 2020 was out of the question. I mean, people like, can I get a smaller turkey? I'm like, sorry, I'm sold out. It's October. Like, yeah, I, I have a couple left, but I don't know what I'm going to have. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, nobody's coming anymore. So it's just my husband and I, and we're not going to want a 22 pound turkey. I yeah. said, well, I don't know what to tell you. I can't you. go change the birds <laughs> right. out in the field. They yeah. they are what they are. Yeah. At this and point. Those, those grow charts that they give you are. When it comes to pasture raise, there's then, no way. You might as well throw them <laughs> out the window. Or or add two or three weeks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know that one of the things that we have difficulty explaining to brand new customers is the fact that a retail, a fresh retail case in, say, a butcher shop, a mm-hmm. traditional or a meat counter at a grocery store, does not represent the animal very well. No. Uh, because to look at the case, you would think that the animal is mostly steaks. Right. And maybe like a few roasts and things. Yep. And there's a tiny, over in the corner, a tiny little th- pan of ground beef. Ground beef, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Too bad it's total opposite. <laughs> the animal is at least 50% ground beef. Right. And if your people are not really creative with their cuts that they want to deal with. Yes. Then it's even more. That is a big issue. Yeah. Huge issue. So people would love you if you just sold ribeyes and bacon. Oh. If I think you could make a Ribeyes, New off York of strip, filet, yeah. and bacon. And w- when that guy comes up with that animal, I want it. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, start raising <laughs> that best. breed. Yep. <laughs> it's tough. And especially the people that ask for quarters and halves of beef. Like, yeah. well, how much am I going to get? I, I need The I need amount that the, the animal has. Yeah. <laughs> I need all the steaks. Yeah. Well, okay, that's great. But you want filet. You're, you're going to get what? 
three pounds of fillet off of an animal? Yeah, mm-hmm. off of a he- yeah, de- depending on the creature, because these grass fed animals can really vary, right? Depending on genetics, and yeah, I mean, most of the time, I'd say a half is about three pounds, okay, is what we've run into. Yep. Everybody's like, Wait, that's it? I said, Yeah, well, every Christmas we do a whole fillet. I said, mm-hmm. Well, that's half of an animal, like, yeah. Well, what about the steaks? Everybody needs one in the family, so we need four steaks. I'm like, yeah. well, okay, there's only, what? There's like 12, 12 ribeyes yep, that come on a half, on a half. so 24. Yeah. So you're, you are you got to have some for the next guy right. that comes along. He's going to ask for something. Right. So just so people know, that's why the prime cuts like a ribeye steak. That's the favorite. That's, right. that's the big one, right? That's why they are priced accordingly. It's not that we are trying to rip people off. It's right. that there's a finite amount and we need to control, we need to incentivize yes. sales of other items. Correct. And so that you don't just run out of these immediately. I, I still do. <laughs> <laughs> they are always, filet is always sold a month before the animal's even processed. And what's your price per pound on that? On filet? Yeah. $38. 38 So, and it's gone. Gone right away. No people. questions asked. Doesn't matter. And I have a list of people that yeah. that that want it for future animals that they're just waiting. Yeah, I mean it. Between that, New York strip, ribeyes, uh, chuck Big. roast. Oh yeah, chuck. I, I could use about thirty more pounds of chuck roast per mm-hmm. animal. That'd be great. And just so people know, again from the butcher's perspective, this is all coming from the top line of the animal. So it is not a muscle locomotion. That's why it is tender. Is because it's a support muscle it's all along the skeletal system so the chuck roaster in the front and you move to the ribeyes and then the t-bone and porterhouse or in the boneless version the new york strips and then your sirloins are sort of in that in between so you get really amazing flavor there tenderness enough to suit most people i think there's a few people that right. don't care for but, it but. but what gets me is i can sell new york strips and filet all day you know how hard it is to sell a porterhouse and a t-bone People don't want the bone-in version right. of those. <laughs> but they love the bone-in ribeye. I can't I figure don't know. it out. I don't know. I, 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 I like the no idea. the bone-in. I think it helps keep the steak a little bit warmer on the plate. Yeah. I really like a nice uh, hot steak. I don't like to eat a cold. I think it adds a lot more flavor, too. Oh, absolutely. And it. I give it to uh, my two-year-old. He'll sit there yeah. for, you know, 10 minutes, 15. After everybody's done eating, that. he'll just eat. He'll <laughs> just, yeah. Yep. I think he's a part, like, uh, he's some kind of wild animal. Maybe like <laughs> raccoon. <laughs> it would not surprise me, digging in the trash can. and So I know one thing that we don't do at Keystone, we do all fully frozen product. Mm-hmm. And you have a fresh case from yes. time to time. Uh, yes. is that's It's not consistent. It has to do with when you process an Correct. animal because there's gaps. You process Correct. one like every two months maybe? Uh, yeah, right now it's every other month. Okay, I'm going nice. to have to up that for the upcoming year and this fall. Actually, this fall we should have a lot more. And beef is one animal every other month. We do a hog once a month and then okay. fresh chicken every week. Which is a big time commitment, but it's amazing, right? Yeah. That, that's a but huge gift that you can give your client base, but there's to have a fresh product as a small producer yeah. is very difficult because you it's seasonal, like mm-hmm. you're, you're combating everything oh, yeah, to do that. And butcher dates. Absolutely. Uh, we both use the same USDA processor, mm-hmm. uh, Highway Meats in Wolmelsdorf. They do a a lot of uh, grass-fed and pasture-based mm-hmm. animals for the locals. But it can be difficult to get dates when you, you know, consist. you have to plan right. Oh yeah, a year in advance. Uh, October of 23, I chose all my processing dates for the year of 24. So I have no idea what I'm going to need then. I'm just guessing. Mm-hmm. You have to make a pretty good estimate. Right. And then all of your fresh pickup or your fresh sales are based off of those dates. Right. Because it, it doesn't stay, it's not good. Oh, in, no, in, no, it, um, it gets bad after it's fresh. People, yeah. it, our, when we have fresh beef, our sales skyrocket. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable. People will come and buy six, eight, ten pounds of ground beef. They'll buy four or five steaks. They'll buy this, that. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, well, this thing's all but gone. People will not buy in bulk when it's frozen. They're buying it to put in their freezer. But I think it's a, it's a mental thing where they think, I don't oh, understand it's fresher. That. It's fresher. That they know the because exact date exactly. that it went they in They know there. when they bought it. So it's fresher versus if I hang on to it and they buy it over the next four weeks, right. I might be cycling in something that's two years old. and Which you don't do, by the way. We don't have the inventory. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> I couldn't do. I even couldn't if you do wanted it if to. I tried. Yeah. So there is some comfort in knowing, did it yourself, that you had a hand right. in it. And 
So that actually brings me to another question. Would you recommend people do this themselves? Like, would you encourage someone to begin homesteading? Because there's been a huge boom since the aforementioned. I would say absolutely. I mean, there is no better way to know where your food's coming from Mm -hmm. unless you're going to do it yourself. And, I mean, there's plenty of farmers out there. Some are more trusting than others. Um, So you really have to pay attention to who you're talking to, get to know them first, and, like, see that they are legit. Mm -hmm. Because it's very easy to tell you that you're getting A and you're really getting C. I mean, if you're interested in it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say jump in head first and say I'm going to Start with get the rich. chickens. Yeah. Just get a couple egg layers, throw them in the backyard. You want to do a, pa- a batch or two of meat birds, 15, 20 a year, throw in your freezer. And if so if someone starts down this path, and inevitably it leads to a hog or two, and then yep. the beef come along, and then after a while you're like, oh, you know, let's see, because your neighbors are always like friends and family. You're like, oh, that stuff's pretty good you have going on it's, there. Yeah. And then I want some. And you need to figure out pricing and you need to figure out all these things. I think if nothing else, people will gain a larger appreciation for the per- people yes, who are absolutely. currently producing. Absolutely. Because people tell me it's all the time, difficult. especially our egg customers, hey, I'm not going to be buying eggs from you anymore. Uh, it's nothing that you did. We love your eggs, but we got our own chickens. Yep. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm, yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. Hey, if you have any questions, by all means, please stop by. I will help you through anything. And I will, but at maximum one year. Yeah. And inevitably a hawk comes along or yep. something. And these like, these are real problems. So we are not putting these people down no. for doing it, for trying it. Right? right. So I saw so many people raise hogs in 20, 21 and 22, and they stopped. Mm-hmm. They would put six hogs in and then they realized just how low the margins are. Yes. And Absolutely. how great the risk is. We've had guys have hogs get hit on the road. They get, mm-hmm. they get out. They weren't properly electric fence trained and they lost them. Yeah. Well, okay. That's risk. That is one thing that I train them to an electric fence for way longer than they need to be because yeah. I don't want to take any risk. Yeah. Because you do have a road going yeah. by there. That's you know fairly oh, yeah. reasonably Very traveled. Busy. That, that is a real issue. Oh, yeah. And of course, and all that's the hawks, that's why we have now three livestock guardian dogs. Oh yeah. I mean the one that they even protect one, Against the hawks. I didn't realize oh, that yeah. they would go. Oh, absolutely. I witnessed it for the, the first time a couple of years ago. Um, we had one dog, and I was like, why am I still losing all these chickens? This is insane. Here we had a heavier coyote and fox population than I ever thought, mm-hmm. and hawks. I mean, there were so many hawks that just sit, and I'd look at them. You can't really do anything to deter a hawk. Correct. Not legally. There's... Well, Bottle rockets work okay. for a short period of time, and then they get then used they, to that. They're just enjoying just the fireworks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I said, okay, it's time to get a second dog. So we got a second dog, trained him. And right before I actually put him out to the pasture for, for good, I was out moving the, the chicken tractors, the hoop houses, with a four-wheeler, and this one chicken is running as fast as it can right to me. Now, I can't hear what's going on. Four-wheeler's running, you know. Mm-hmm. And the dog's right there with me, and I could see the pupils in – Falcon's eyes. It was that close to me swooping down for this chicken. I just flailed my arms up, scared the heck out of him because he scared me. Yeah. And the dog just chased after him, barking like crazy. And I'm Because he was low at that point. Yeah. And so he was and I'm down. screaming, good girl, good girl, you good girl. And she stopped and turned around and looked at me and wagging her tail. I said, oh, yeah. gosh, <laughs> I just ruined it. She has Should've now just caught left. the next two dogs to look up. Mm-hmm. If there's so, a buzzer that goes by, they're chasing it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. The, the, the male that we have. He chases the uh, the swallows that come in and eat the bugs. So very super alert. Yeah. Oh yeah. That our male he is going to be a tough one to beat, and he's not even a purebred. He's spoiling you a little yeah, bit for. He is. He's he's working harder. Well, not harder than you, but he's working hard. No, he is because he's twenty four seven. Yeah, he's out there. <laughs> he lives with the chickens. Yeah, they're in the five acre pasture. They go anywhere and everywhere that they want. Chickens try and eat their food. Oh, the dog's yeah. food, you have to feed them separate. Yeah, because even if you feed them meat, chickens will go for, oh, yeah. chickens will eat fat and things. Yep. That's very interesting. So we talked about some of the difficult parts of it, talking to customers, explaining exactly what you have. I think that's the difficulty versus what they expect. So what is your favorite part about being a producer? What keeps you coming back? And I say producer because a farmer 
typically sells his items, you're a producer because you are also marketing them. Right. It's, it's a little bit more encompassing. Mm -hmm. And so what's your favorite part? Favorite part is probably the feedback from some of the customers. Nothing better than getting a pat on the back. I mean, who doesn't enjoy that yeah. from anybody really? But when you have a new customer that walks up and they look at the prices and their jaw drops, because there's a lot of time and energy goes into this, oh, and like we said, well, risk as that. well. I mean, it's such a small scale versus they're like, well, this meat guy over here, yeah, they're in the Reading market. There are, other than myself, there are one, two, three, four places to buy beef and pork, and there's a total of I think six places to buy chicken. Healthy competition, no doubt. Oh yeah, and, and everybody walks by, and like, oh, that's the organic stand. And I'm like, no, we're not organic. We're non-GMO pasture raised, but mm -hmm. that's neither here nor there with that guy. Yeah, but. The, the, the customers that come and they say, well, I'll give it a try. What would you recommend? Without doubt, I always say a thigh. Yeah. By far my favorite. It's the most fat in it. It's going to be like it the wow. It cooks the best. You, you, it's a very forgiving cut. Like you can overcook it and it's still going to be delicious. And you also use what breed of chicken? Sorry, just to go back to that. Color yield. Color yield. So yeah, this is coming. Cross. So I worked at the hatchery that mm -hmm. they come from. Uh, the hatches them here locally. It's very close to our shop. And they're a little bit of a slower growing bird. So... Cornish Cross is predominantly used. That's everywhere. In it's certainly exclusively used in chicken houses. Yeah, um, I would say yeah, probably ninety five percent of the United States mm -hmm. chicken is is coming oh, yeah. is a Cornish Cross. And even the 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 pasture raised uh, everybody. Yeah, doing a lot bird. of guys will do that. But the color yields grow just slightly slower. The color color yield because they're actually a bit reddish mm -hmm. or, or brownish in color, and there's something special about the fat flavor it's, of these animals it's everything it, they, it's a cross between a white and a red yeah so it, there's like three quarter red one quarter white and every bird is different you'll have some that'll get that long keel from the red others that'll grow like a football just like the the cornish the cornish will mm -hmm. but they put a little bit of that heritage yes back into them they're still an efficient bird but you just get this huge yeah bloom in exactly flavor. and the, the flavor is 10 times better like mm -hmm. people say i've had pasture raised chicken before why is yours better well, it's the breed. I yeah. mean, it, there's breed and feed. That's the two things else, yes. that goes into what you're doing. And then you mentioned non-GMO feed versus mm -hmm. organic. So for ourselves, we have some of these sort of middle of the road products as well. It is tempting to want to go really extreme. And I say extreme because it is the one end mm -hmm. of food and soy free, organic. My desire is to feed families. Right. And I think that people who are working for a living, it becomes out of sight to afford some of these really super specialty products. I think those yes. are there and they serve people with, and this is just my personal opinion, right? They serve people with extreme health concerns mm -hmm. because there are some people who really have to like dig down and be like, yeah, I need completely chemical free right. everything because of something else that they're fighting. But I think this is a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And certainly an entry level. Like you said, oh, yeah. a lot of the people you're talking to are just starting into this, mm -hmm. they're trying to use a producer for the first time. It is so much fun to welcome someone in. And if they choose to go up, let's say a price bracket, right? there are those people as well. Uh, but you're doing a, cons you're giving a consistent product. You're able to produce it at a reasonable price reliably. And there is huge, huge value in that in my mind. Right. Um, and, and my thing, people say, oh, or you're not organic. I'm not buying it. Mm -hmm. Especially on the chicken end. And I say, Why? I only eat organic. I said, okay, can you tell yeah. me why? Well, it's better for you. I said, the only difference between an organic raised bird and a conventional raised bird is the feed that they're eating. Correct. They're still grown in a barn. Mm -hmm. They still never see the light of day. Yes, yep. they have access, but they don't. Right. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, I'm not going to, they're like, well, then why don't you just go organic? And I said, I'm not going to pay all that extra money for that piece of paper mm -hmm. that, in my eyes, when it comes to protein, organic isn't needed. It's non-GMO it helps the farmer. It helps you. It's not going to be as expensive and right. there's and a lot less hoops to jump. Right. And because you, you have to have the sales too. Like if right. you're going to lose a bunch of people, if you jump to the next price. Yeah, our, and our market is already smaller. Right. I don't want to make it even smaller yet. Right. And as a small producer, it is very easy if you get enough of interest in something. Mm -hmm. Like we're having some people ask about chemical free hogs and I actually have the means to do it. Uh, the guy that we source our barn raised hogs from, we raise our, the woods raised mm -hmm. just like you do. I shouldn't say just like you do. It's a right. similar system. And he has the ability to, uh, so we might run a chemical-free okay. test run of hogs. But that's the kind of things 
that you can implement as you're interacting with your customer base. Right. Is there enough of call for this to make it worthwhile? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you're going to do that, but like that is the privilege of a small producer right. is you can pivot with the demand. Yeah. And it makes it a lot of fun because it, it adds new layers. And like you said, as you want to grow, you know, there's so much uh, in the way of possibility, but you have to start somewhere. Right. Cause, and and that's, that was one of the things I ran into our first year. How am I going to do pasture chicken year round? You mm -hmm. can't do it. I've put my head down and I said, you know what? I'm going to do it my first year. And I lost my tail. It was miserable. I found out how to keep water from freezing mm -hmm. down to 10 degrees. But after that, it was game over. Yeah. But I talked to the customers. And I said, hey, I can't have fresh chicken year round. I can grow everything in the summertime and then bring it to the market and keep it here frozen. Mm -hmm. Or I could just add alfalfa to their feed. So they're still getting the green grass, yep. technically. And I can push them through the barn and do it that way. And then you can get fresh chicken. Mm -hmm. So your consensus do that. Yeah. In the winter, you do raise them in the barn, you're saying. Yes. And then, but that right. allows you to keep that supply because of your specific market stand. It's a little bit different than right. a lot of producers because right. a lot of guys just quit. Yeah. But then you would have nothing. A and lot then of markets close down for the winter time as well. Yeah. Versus this goes year round. Yeah. And I'm sure as heck not going to make enough in the summer to right. pay rent all winter. Right. Right. <laughs> I think that's great. And again, you are able to communicate with your customer base. That's something that these big brands, they just sort right. of do their thing. And I think that is what makes this so personal, so unique and very rewarding is because your customers are literally a part of what you're doing. Absolutely. They're, they're changing the way that you farm with their dollars. And right. I, I think that's a huge privilege on the customer's part mm -hmm. when they're buying from a small local producer. Right. And so, you know, don't badger your producer, <laughs> um, but it is good to have those conversations yeah. and, and politely ask and do ask the questions because, you know, if you want to support somebody, you have to know what they're doing. Right. And that's part of why I want to like dive into some of these specifics. Mm -hmm. It might be a little bit dry for some people. I apologize, but I want to know. Yeah. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I have, I have had your uh, barn raised chicken. It's, it's very good as well, yeah. but like you said, it, it's a specific need, and that's really super. Yeah. So if people want to support you, how? what is the best way that you know they watch this podcast and they say, I, I like this guy, I'd like to be a part of what he's doing. What's the best way? Obviously, going and purchasing right. your product for any farmer is going to be the biggest help. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, swing by the market if you're in the Reading area. Where I'll put those Reading fairgrounds in the comments. Um, we're also in Malvern. Right now, it's every other Saturday. Summer, it's uh, weekly. My wife and I kind of flip-flop back and forth. Usually, it's weather pending. So, I go to more winter markets than she does. Okay. Uh, she just puts you in the out of doors. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind it. I mean, obviously, just the support. And we're very thankful for anyone and everyone that is willing and able to support by buying our products. And honestly, like, people always say, they're like, well, I'll, I'll try it. And they come back the next week, and they're like, that was the best chicken I've ever had. What do you do? And I said, it's not what I do. It's what I don't do to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. very simple. It literally goes from our farm to a cooler, to the case, to your table. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, not they'll, they'll tell steps. you that you can get two and three day processed chicken from Cisco, but I'm not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> literally not going to buy it. Yeah. And I'll, I will link all that stuff. Okay. So for, and I'll call myself a farmer because you know, if, if I have to wrestle a calf and risk peril, physical oh, yeah. peril, and and I own you know several animals, then I'm gonna I'm gonna call myself a farmer, even though I am uh, very much involved in the business part of it. So what are your what are some of your favorite farming stories? Some oh, something peculiar. Our farm is located right across the street from my parents. They bought a farm 12 years ago. My sister bought 10 acres from them, built a house. We then bought the property across the street. Now that's our farm, and the goats are out front. The steers are in the back. Chickens are on the side. My sister has many of videos of me running around like a fool, trying to catch goats to worm them or just catch a pregnant nanny to put her in her. I, I put little pens in so the first week with the kids, they get the bond, and it's just them. They don't have yep. competition or anything. Me running around with a lasso trying to catch these goats on foot lassoing oh goats. yes yes <laughs> running you know by myself no cutoff man to help push yeah. them one way or another so yeah it's it, she has sent me many of them 
because snow, rain, beautiful day, doesn't matter. It's just mayhem no matter what. That's the challenge of a pasture-based system is that these animals are, yeah. you know, they're out there. And you can give them some feed and, and bring them in. But um, sometimes you're like, oh, I'll just get lucky quick and yeah. I, I want like, to like grab goats one. Do get green. Yeah. And I have them, if I go out there and throw four rocks in a bucket and start shaking it and walking mm-hmm. it towards them, they will come sprinting. Sprinting. The cows, they, they don't know what grain is. I mean, they're right. 100% grass, so trying to corral them is almost impossible by yourself. Mm-hmm. I did do it this past week, but it was not fun. That is not something I would want to attempt. No. Uh, <laughs> no, it took a very long time. Because <laughs> out of the seven animals we had, I needed one specific animal to go mm-hmm. to processing, yep. and that one just did not want to cooperate. You, you can't just shake the bucket and, no. and call them in. They have to actually be herded into right. the corral. And you did purchase a very nice corral system I saw yep. when I was there. Not cheap. No, not by the way, means. but worth every penny if yeah, I had to guess. Every penny and then some. Yeah. I mean, it saved me big time. That is not fun. The the, the herding of the goats isn't very funny because then they catch on. And now it's to the point that they know if they see the lasso, off they go. <laughs> off they go. Should have been a cowboy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, loading pigs, that tends to be a, a nightmare as well. Fortunately, you have a trailer. Yes. So if you have to, the old trick with hogs is that you actually leave the trailer in the meadow and then feed them on there, yeah. and then you can usually fool them. See, I don't do that either, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> I built a corral system out of hog panels, and then I actually went now because I had a couple jumpers. People tell me, oh, right. pigs don't jump. Yeah, they yeah. do. Yep, they can. They do. Mm-hmm. When they want to, they will jump almost anything. And now I have these hog gates that I have set up, and then I just stand behind them with a plastic panel and mm-hmm. just kind of push them on but i do dump food on the trailer so they see it smell it and they they want to go there anyway but there's a handful that they'll they'll push back yeah so for folks that are familiar with working hogs animals that are very low to the ground or swine in particular for some reason they perceive if you have a plastic hog panel so it's just a solid sheet of plastic that has hand holds on it maybe about three by Three and a half, three by two, something yeah. like that. And they actually perceive that as an immovable barrier. And so you are able to work, move them through a corral system very nicely because they, without using force uh, most of the time, it, because they perceive <laughs> it as uh, a barrier. And for whatever reason, I don't know why yeah. that works on them. Uh, cattle just seem to want to just blow right for past sure. you. They yeah. don't care. And catching turkeys is always a nightmare. Too. <laughs> That's always <laughs> god awful. So one thing that makes turkeys so difficult is that they are the breast of a turkey. The yeah. prized part when you are carving for Thanksgiving is the muscle that controls the wing, yeah. that powers the wing. And so when you are catching a turkey, it is incredibly strong because it has been bred for meat. Yes. That's the thing that people don't realize. Black Angus are bred for muscle growth, which causes them to be incredible athletes Yeah, and very uh, very agile a lot yeah. of the time. And, and as... As silly as the broad-breasted white turkeys are, when it comes to catch time, they they know how to go the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. This past year, though, I found a new method. It actually worked to a degree, a lot better than in the past, where I used to kind of just corral them into a corner and just jump in and grab one and put it mm-hmm. in the trailer. I actually created a corral system. For turkeys. For turkeys. Didn't feed them the day before. Mm-hmm. They had access to grass, but they didn't get any grain. I came in there with a bag of food, dumped it in a trough. They all came running, closed it behind them, and it kind of just necked down narrower and narrower mm-hmm. till I had him right at the trailer, and I walked a couple in, picked him up, put him in. And it was magical. In the past, I've tried to take a piece of fence and wrap around in a corner, and it was just an absolute nightmare. They they see what you're up to. Oh, yeah, and, they, and, and when they see a fence, they'll just charge right through it. It doesn't matter. They'll mm-hmm. stand on top of one another to get Yep, that is, it. that's, crowding is a huge yeah. uh, problem with poultry, and so solving it with creative solutions that are animal-friendly is huge. Yeah. That's why the corral system for the beef is so important is because it allows you to handle them in a way that they don't injure themselves. Right. Especially with turkeys. Like you said, climbing on top of one another, they can suffocate and And injure themselves. I do 90% of the work by myself Mm -hmm. up until the most recent months. Um, My wife had a full-time job and the kids come home and somebody's got to be with the kids. And if I'm not done for the day, I'm there by myself all day and then into the night too. But since she came and started helping, 
it has been night and day with everything. Yeah. It goes 10 times quicker. I mean, just having another person when you're trying to work an animal is just so much easier. So this is your sole income? Yeah. Now? Yes. It is. That's amazing. It is. That's like the dream. That's what people want is yeah. to, especially when you're passionate about something, is to be able to go full time and have, I, I, especially in a traditional marriage, have your spouse join you right. and like be super effective. And it's it's one way, like if I'm not home as much as I thought I was going to be, I thought, hey, I could go in, knock this out for the day, and boom, I'm home. No, it goes into the night, into the next morning sometimes, but it's one way for us to spend time together as well. I mean, it might sound right. ridiculous, but hey, you're. Yeah. what's the difference if you're sitting on your couch at home talking to each other or you're there pushing hogs through through a corral to load them up for the processor? I think it makes, of course, this is you know personality dependent, but for us, right. it adds so much to our marriage to be able to work together. Yeah. And then, especially when you can involve the children. Yeah. Specific, it's just... It, it's such a natural thing to do. Yeah, because the kids love to go out and chase things towards you. Okay. So uh, they're, they're they're the bird dogs. They they, they bring everything down yeah. in, and, yeah. and then we handle it from there. Yeah. Train them up. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank I you. enjoyed it immensely. We'll do it again sometime. Yeah, for sure. We will uh, come up with some more stories, and people are going to love to dig into this a little bit more. I love being able to talk to other producers that are successful because I think that's the key, right? Anybody can can start and try to do it, but there are so many obstacles. The barrier yeah. to entry is so high. It is. For a lot of this, uh, to actually do it to a place where you can get to two incomes yeah, from your pasture base. Yeah, because it, it's it was a rocky road to start, but it has been worth every drop of blood, every tear, every ounce of thought. I, I mean, it... It was not easy by any means, but I have never been happier than where I'm at now with the business, the family, you know, it, it, it's a juggling act, but at the same time, like the kids don't really enjoy the farm yet. They were brought up in it, but not exactly. Like we just purchased the farm in 2019, started building in summer of 20. So it's still fairly new for them that we, yeah. our house isn't there. So yeah, it's, it's difficult, it's, but they're... I think they're going to enjoy it more as they get older because I always tell them all the time, like, hey, finish this and then we'll go for a four-wheeler ride or we'll do this or that. Family time up there is very important to us as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you've been repping on the... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Oh, wrong that's, one. What, that's what the kids say. B- big arms over here. Big. Say, oh, hey, that's throwing those feet bags around. <laughs> Got to, you, you're doing your own work. That's good. I just like to see when it's on me and when it's not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then that quick, you'll press the button. And yeah. <laughs> I, I keep it moving. But but you know very acutely, like, I want to know what it feels like to be Blake Miller. For a right-wing God Rock and Eagle. <laughs> type, no. 